In the American legal system, laws serve as the bedrock for maintaining order and promoting justice in society. These laws are established through four primary sources: the United States Constitution, federal and state statutes, administrative regulation, and case law. The first source of law is the United States Constitution. It's the most fundamental source of law. The source that all others draw from, the Constitution is the supreme law of the United States, outlining the structure of the federal government and the rights and responsibilities of citizens. The seven articles of the U.S. Constitution establish the three branches of government: the legislative, executive, and judicial. Article one establishes the legislative branch. Which consists of the Senate and the House representatives. Article Two establishes the executive branch, which consists of the President, Vice President, and various executive departments and agencies. Article Three establishes the judicial branch, which consists of the Supreme Court and other federal courts. The remaining articles cover topics such as the relationship between the states and the federal government. The process for amending the Constitution and the supremacy of federal law. The seven articles of the U.S. Constitution were written by the founding father of the United States during the first Constitutional Convention held in 1787 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Constitutional Convention was held for the purpose of addressing the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. Which had been the governing document of the United States since 1781. Under the Articles of Confederation, the federal government was weak and unable to effectively govern the country. The government lacked the power to tax, regulate commerce, or raise an army, and there was no federal court system to adjudicate disputes between states. As a result. The country faced economic upheaval, political instability, and the potential threats to national security. In response to these challenges, a group of leading statesmen and political thinkers convened in Philadelphia in May 1787 to discuss potential reforms to the Articles of Confederation. However, it quickly became clear that. The problem was too deep-seated to be resolved just through mere amendment, and the delegates instead set out to create a new governing document, the U.S. Constitution. Over the course of several months, the delegates engaged in intense debates and negotiations, working to craft a document that would establish a strong federal government with a system of checks and balances and protections for individual rights. The resulting Constitution, which was ratified by the states in 1788, represented a landmark achievement in the history of democratic governance and has served as the foundation for the United States political system ever since. It's important to note that the founding fathers of the United States chose a republican form of government rather than a pure democracy for a number of reasons. One reason was that the founding fathers was wary of direct democracy because they believed that it could lead to the oppression of minority groups. For example, they were concerned that if decisions were made purely by popular vote, the majority might be able to enact laws or policies that harmed smaller groups. To avoid this, they established a system of representative government. In which elected officials would be responsible for making decisions on behalf of the people. This system was designed to ensure that the interests of all citizens were taken into account, not just those of the majority. For example, the House of Representatives is apportioned based on population, while the Senate provides equal representation for each state, regardless of its population. In the case of the U.S. electoral system, 
citizens do not directly elect the president and vice president, but instead elect representatives, known as electors, who are responsible for casting the votes that ultimately determine the outcome of the presidential election. The electoral system is intended to provide a balance between the popular will of the people and the interests of individual states. It gives small states a proportionally larger voice in presidential election because they are guaranteed a minimum of three electors. This helps to ensure that the interests of small states are taken into account in presidential elections. But one downside of the electoral system is that candidates often focus their campaigning and resources on swing states. Where the outcome of the election is uncertain, another downside of the electoral system is that it is possible for a candidate to win the presidency without winning the popular vote. There have been five United States presidential elections in which the candidates who won the presidency did not win the popular vote. They were John Quincy Adams in 1824. Rutherford B. Hayes in 1876, Benjamin Harrison in 1888, George W. Bush in 2000, Donald Trump in 2016. Another reason that the founding fathers of the United States chose a republican democracy rather than a pure democracy was the sheer size of the country and the difficulty of coordinating and managing direct democracy. On a national scale, for example, in a direct democracy, every citizen would need to have a say in every decision that affected the entire country, which would be impractical and time-consuming. By contrast, a republic allows the citizens to elect representatives who can make decisions on their behalf, with the understanding that. These representatives will act in the best interests of the people they represent. In addition, the founding fathers were influenced by the classical republican tradition, which held that citizens had a duty to participate in the political process and to act in the best interests of the community as a whole. The founding fathers believed that. A republic, with its emphasis on elected officials and the public services, would encourage citizens to take an active role in their government and to act with the common good in mind. For example, they believe that elected officials would be more likely to act in the interest of their constituents if they knew that they would need to seek re-election in the future. Many of the ideas in the U.S. Constitution can be traced back to English political theory, particularly the writings of John Locke, who argued for limited government, individual rights, and the consent of the governed. The founding fathers also drew on the experience of ancient Greece and Rome, which had established systems of democratic governance that served as models for the American Republic. In addition, the Constitution was influenced by the experience of the founding fathers themselves, who had lived through the tumultuous period of the American Revolution and had seen firsthand the dangers of unchecked government power. They were also influenced by the failures of the Articles of Confederation, which had established a weak federal government that was unable to effectively govern the country. In addition to the seven articles, the amendments to the Constitution modify or add to the existing provisions of the Constitution. There are currently 27 amendments to the Constitution. The first ten of which are known as the Bill of Rights. They protect individual liberties. For example, the first amendment prohibits Congress from making laws that abrogate freedom of speech. The Fourth Amendment guarantees a person's right to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures, and the Fourteenth Amendment protects the civil rights and the liberties of all Americans, particularly those who were previously enslaved or oppressed.
over the last 230 years, how these amendments are applied to our society has evolved, but their foundational protections have remained steady. Federal and state legislation, also known as statutory law, is the second important source of law in our legal system. The United States Congress enacts federal statutes, and these statutes apply in all 50 states. Here are some examples of the federal statutes that have an impact on education in the United States. Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA. This federal statute, enacted in 1975 and reauthorized several times since then, sets out requirements for the education of students with disabilities. The IDEA requires that students with disabilities be provided with a free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment possible and that their education be tailored to their individual needs. The Every Student Succeeds Act This federal statute, enacted in 2015, sets out a requirement for educational accountability and improvement in public schools. It requires states to administer annual standardized tests in reading and math, but also provides more flexibility to states in terms of how they use these test results and how they measure school performance. ESSA also includes provisions related to early childhood education, teacher preparation, and the support of English language learners and disadvantaged students. Higher Education Act This federal statute, originally enacted in 1965 and reauthorized several times since then, provides funding and other support for higher education institutions and students. It provides for federal financial aid programs such as Pell Grants and student loans and sets out requirements for institutional accountability and transparency. Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 This federal statute prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in education programs and activities that receive federal funding. Title IX requires schools to provide equal opportunities for male and female students in athletics, and to address and prevent sexual harassment and assault. Transgender athletes policy can be related to Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. State statutes are enacted by state legislatures and apply only within the state. In the state of Georgia, state statutes related to education include Quality Basic Education Act, this state statute, enacted in 1985, provides the framework for funding and delivering education in Georgia. The Quality Basic Education Act establishes the state's funding formula for education, which takes into account factors such as student enrollment, teacher salaries, and local property values. The act also sets out standards for student achievement and provides for the assessment of student progress. State statutes regulate activity within a state, but they must give way to federal statutes in case of conflict. The United States Constitution's Supremacy Clause, Article 6, Clause 2, provides that the Constitution and the federal laws are the supreme law of the land. State statutes that conflict federal law are preempted. Administrative regulations are another important source of law. They are rules for how a law will be applied and enforced. At the federal level, the Department of Education is responsible for implementing and enforcing federal laws related to education, such as IDEA and ESSA. Moreover, the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is a federal agency responsible for enforcing federal laws that prohibit workplace discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, and disability. As part of its enforcement responsibilities, the EEOC issues regulations interpreting and applying the laws that enforces 
These regulations provide guidance to employers and employees about their rights and responsibilities under the law, and are binding on employers and employees to the extent that they are consistent with the law. At the state level, the Georgia Department of Education is a state agency responsible for implementing and enforcing state laws related to education, such as the Quality Basic Education Act. Moreover, the Georgia Professional Standards Commission is responsible for issuing and enforcing teaching certificates in Georgia. The commission sets out requirements for teacher certification and renewal, and also investigates and disciplines teachers who violate ethical or professional standards. Administrative regulations are subjected to judicial review, which means that they can be challenged in court. If they are inconsistent with or violate the law, for example, in May 2020, the U.S. Department of Education issued new regulations under Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. These regulations were immediately controversial and were challenged in court by a number of advocacy groups and educational institutions. Some of the most controversial provisions of the 2020 Title IX regulations include changes to how schools must respond to allegations of sexual harassment and assault. The U.S. Department of Education's regulations establish new procedures for investigating and adjudicating allegations of sexual harassment and assault, including live hearings and the right to cross-examine witnesses. Advocacy groups and educational institutions argue that these procedures were overly adversarial and would create a chilling effect for survivors who may be deterred from reporting harassment and assault out of fear of retaliation or retribution. In August 2020, a federal judge issued a preliminary injunction blocking some of the most controversial provisions of the regulation. In addition to court challenges, administrative regulations can also be subject to review and revision by the agency itself. Many agencies have processes in place for reviewing and updating their regulations on a regular basis to ensure that they are consistent with the law and with changing circumstances. Case law is the fourth source of law. It is created by judges as they interpret the meanings of the laws. Case law is sometimes necessary when legislators write broad statutes and allow judges to interpret their meanings by applying them to real cases involving people and businesses. In cases where issues have not been dealt with by the statutes, courts can apply definitions and rules. Based on traditional ways these matters have been dealt with, for example, matters like torts are defined based on tradition dating back centuries, often to English law. Once a court renders a decision, its decision or opinion becomes a precedent that must be applied in subsequent factual scenarios. When a court uses rulings from prior cases to reach a decision, it is abiding by the principle of stare decisis, which promotes even-handedness and predictable application of law. Over time, a body of case law builds up, which provides guidance and precedent for future legal decisions. It's worth noting that these four sources of law. Are not mutually exclusive. Instead, they interact and overlap with one another, working in conjunction to create a robust set of legal guidance. The United States Constitution is the most fundamental source of law. Federal statutes, state statutes, administrative regulations, and judicial opinions must all comply with the Constitution's rules. From the four sources. Laws are the established rules of conduct that maintain stability and justice in the community. In his October 9, 1974, oath of office, President Gerald Ford emphasizes that 
the United States is a government of laws, not men, and that laws provide ways for society to resolve disputes civilly. Without laws, society would be chaotic and unpredictable, with individuals and groups vying for power and resources without any means of resolving their conflicts. Laws also help to protect individual rights and freedoms, ensuring that everyone is treated fairly and equitably under the law, from protecting individual free speech to ensuring access to education. Laws provide the structure and the stability that are necessary for a well-functioning society. For administrators in education, laws are crucial for ensuring that schools operate in a fair, transparent, and equitable manner. Laws provide a legal framework for addressing issues related to student discipline, special education, teacher rights and responsibilities. Procedural justice, due process, and other critical areas of school administration. Additionally, laws related to funding, accreditation, and other areas of education policy can help administrators to make informed decisions and ensure that their schools are operating in compliance with applicable laws and regulations. Ultimately, the importance of laws for administrators in education cannot be overstated, as they provide the legal and ethical foundation for creating safe, welcoming, and supportive learning environments for all students.